The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. So I'm so glad to see all y'all gathered in here today. And, uh, you know, I find myself dealing with the technical stuff that goes on back there in the corner more than I need to. So if I hadn't got a chance to say hello to you today, I just want to say it's good to be together. And God is with us. And let's just open our hearts to everything he wants to do. If you're, uh, let, Let's pray to begin, and then Daryl will come and help us with announcements and songs, and uh, it'll be a good time. Lord, thank you for your grace and your love and for the fact that we know that you're here with us. Help us, Lord, to just open our hearts and hear your voice and be obedient to everything you want to do for us today. We thank you. Amen. Amen. Uh, Daryl, come. Good morning. A few announcements this morning. The building committee will have a meeting this Thursday, March 9th at 5 p.m. Uh, the members of that committee are listed in the bulletin, so if you're able, we'd love to have you. Next Sunday, exciting, we get to get up an hour earlier mm, to come on in. So uh, don't forget, time change next Sunday. Um, this past Wednesday evening, the Church Council Administrative Board voted to ask for a special church conference to vote on disaffiliation from the United Methodist Church. Uh, we're going to be required to submit several documents uh, to the Tennessee Western Kentucky Annual Conference, and then the district superintendent will set a date for a vote. It requires a two-thirds majority to disaffiliate, and you must be present to vote. Susan, do you have some? Thank you, Susan. If you have any questions about disaffiliation, I'm sure you could call on one of the church uh, admin council members to discuss that. Um, but mostly, pray to God for help to charge our path in the future. Um, the last announcement is beginning on March 15th, Blanton's Chapel will have Wednesday evening Bible studies and share a meal together. We are invited, so uh, see Pastor Bob for more details if you're interested in that. Now at this time, we'll sing our first hymn, so if you'd stand, the, the hymn is number 369, Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine, oh what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. 
visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. At this time, please join me in reciting the Apostles' Creed, which is number 881 in the hymnal or on the screen. I, I believe in God, God the, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this time, we invite you to greet your friends and neighbors. Hey, I'm great. Hi. It's so good to so see great. you. I am so great.
Our next hymn is number 359, Alas, and Did My Savior Bleed. We want to go to the Lord in prayer, and it's such a good thing to be here together today. I'll, you you can see the prayer requests that we have uh, here up on our screens and in our bulletins. Do y'all want to update us or tell us about other needs that we ought to pray for today? Yes, Tammy. <laughs> Others? Yes, Alan. Yes, Alan. Uh, 
Others? We traveled up to Robertson County yesterday afternoon after we'd taken some care of some other things around here, and uh, goodness, there's a lot of storm damage. Uh, you know, we've got a house up there that we've got rented out. There is a tree that would have hit the house, except it got caught by another small tree, and so we're trying to figure out how we're going to get that dealt with. But uh, stopped by to visit with my sister. They were without power for 21 hours. Uh, then we called our son and uh, to see if we could go to eat with them. And he said, we're quarantined. Uh, his wife's got COVID again. And uh, so there's still things going on around that we ought to hold each other up in prayer. But we know there are many people been affected by the storms uh, this last week in various ways. Let's lift our hearts to the Lord as we pray today. Oh, Lord, we do thank you for so many things today, most of all for your coming into our world and uh, suffering for us and dying on the cross so that we might, through faith, be able to have our lives transformed by the power of the gospel. And so today, Lord, we just ask that you'd help us over and over and over again to bring to mind uh, these things that you have done for us as well as the way that you work in our lives on an everyday, regular basis. And so, Lord, we ask for you to be at work amongst us. We've got these prayer requests that we've got printed as well as these that have been brought to, to, uh, to us today. We praise your name today, Lord, for Tammy being able to be here with us in this service after she's been through such a tough time. And, uh, Lord, we pray for these needs that she's mentioned as well as others. Uh, many of us carry uh, concerns in our hearts. And so, Lord, we just ask that you'd help us to reach out to you and to know that you are at work in them. We not only pray for ourselves today, though. We recognize that there are needs all over our world. We pray for those whose lives have been affected by our storms. And we also ask, Lord, that you would just uh, be at work uh, in our nation and in all the nations of the world where there is suffering and violence and people dealing with the results of uh, various disasters of uh, many kinds. And Lord, there are people who need your help today and we thank you for the confidence that we have that you are at work in every one of those situations. And we just ask that you would give us by faith the ability to see that you are at work beyond what we can see and know. Now, Lord, we've not prayed out loud for every need represented by the folks here in this place and others in our church today. I just ask that you'd help us to be able to know that as we come before you in this time of silence, that your Holy Spirit is at work and that we can trust in you. Could we pray together the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask our ushers to come and help us with this morning's tithes and offerings.
Lord Jesus, we do thank you for the way you've helped us and blessed us. Help us to be faithful to you in giving back what you've supplied to us so that we might see your kingdom grow in this place and might be the people you've called us to be. Amen. Well, uh, you know, we've been having Susan do the children's sermon each week, but she's unable to be here because she wasn't feeling well today. But Daryl's going to step up, and uh, so we appreciate that. And uh, so we're going to ask our children to gather here uh, this morning. And you brought me an apple, right? Uh, I did. Uh, Who else wants to go back there to <laughs> this morning? Uh, well, bless us. Uh, it's a good thing to have children, but uh, I like apples. I, I you know, I, especially if you add brown sugar and oatmeal and that kind of thing to it. So uh, it's good. Uh, I hope you'll get a Bible somewhere there and follow along with me as re we read from John chapter 3. And I'm going to read verse 1 down to verse 17. Uh, this may be one of the most familiar passages of the Bible. And uh, I, you know, as I went through the week this week and started trying to plan for today, uh, I am going to approach this, I think, differently than what we mostly see it. And uh, that might be a mistake because I think we need to be reminded over and over again of the truths that we know. Uh, but... 
I, I think it'll help us to recognize the nature of reality as God wants us to understand it. So uh, the heading for this section here in chapter 3 in this Bible that I'm using, uh, which may not be what anybody else is looking at today, but the title is The New Birth. And, uh, you know, if you look up here on the screen or in the bulletin, you see that I'm titling the message today, Spiritual Birth, and I think you'll see why that is true as we read through here. Uh, Here's what the scripture says. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly I say to you, We speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who's come down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish and have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, you know, of course... This John 3.16 is the passage that so many people want to focus on and it's been said over and over again and I believe that this is true that that verse contains the whole gospel in it. Everything you need to know to be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that everyone who believes in him might be saved. Now, so, you know, I grew up in an age where we weren't taught to memorize a whole lot, but I encourage you to memorize that one and to be able to say to yourself at every point where you begin to question some of the other things I'm going to talk about today that indeed this is what we need to know. Now, having said that, you know, let's look back at the story because I've heard some tellings that I want to question a little bit about the way that this whole thing broke down. We start out talking about a man named Nicodemus. Now, it's curious to me. We know very little about Nicodemus, and yet it is to Nicodemus that Jesus tells this uh, dramatic telling of the nature of what God wants to do to us. And Nicodemus appears later on in this story as someone who stood up at the end of Jesus' life after he's crucified and uh, along with another person who 
not know much about, Joseph of Arimathea, uh, asked Herod to be able to take the body of Jesus and to bury him. And uh, it is in, uh, best we can tell, you know, a tomb uh, that Joseph owned that Jesus was interred and then later resurrected from the dead. But, so, you know, who is this guy, Nicodemus? Well, the only thing it tells us is that he is a ruler of the Jews. Now, what does that mean? Well, we kind of got to get into the history of the way things were in the Jewish nation uh, and uh, the fact that there was a Jewish ruling council, but they could only do whatever the uh, Roman government under Caesar wanted. And, uh, but among the Jewish people, who understood and still do, by the way, understand themselves to be the special group that had, they were the only ones who had received the word of God and the message of God. And so Nicodemus is one of these special rulers. Now, there's a whole lot about the makeup of that council uh, called the Sanhedrin. You may have heard of that if you've been around church a whole lot talking about what's going on in the Jewish nation. But there's a whole lot about the makeup of that council that we don't really know. We don't know how people got selected. Uh, we know that an awful lot of the uh, people who served uh, in positions of authority were chosen by the Romans. It's one of the reasons why we can, as we read our New Testament Gospels, see that most normal Jewish people didn't trust the government because they were picked out by somebody that they saw as an invading illegitimate government. Uh, I wasn't planning on saying this, but let me go ahead and say what comes to my mind is that uh, we are living in an age of distrust. And I think if we're honest, we can look around and say, we're being lied to by those who ought to be telling us the truth. It's happened a lot. Uh, you know, I got around some people some time ago who began to say, one of the things we need to begin to pray regularly is that the truth will come out. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as I move through this message, but clearly Nicodemus was an honest person serving in a group that were not necessarily carrying out those things that were in the best interest of their people. And yet he wanted to. Now, the next phrase that it tells us after in this passage that tells us uh, that he was a ruler of the Jews tells us that he came to Jesus by night. I've heard an awful lot of preachers talk about the fact that, you know, he was coming to Jesus secretly. That's not what this passage says. It's possible, though, it's a possible interpretation. But what I'd like to believe about Nicodemus, and the reason why I say that he was being honest here is that everything told us here is something that appears to be honest. He didn't pretend when he was corrected by Jesus. And later on we see that he accepted what Jesus said uh, because he was there a follower of Jesus. So uh, we are told later on that uh, you know, he was in a process of learning how to follow Jesus because we're told that he was a follower of Jesus but secretly. There's a problem if you're a follower of Jesus secretly. Y'all hear that? I don't need to expand on that, do I? If you're a secret follower of Jesus, you're not all in. 
And, and so we need to be able to recognize that we don't need to keep it a secret. Now, the fact that Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, though, I would like to believe that the reason he came by night was because he was so busy all day. Not because he could sneak around at night. And, uh, of course, you know, we uh, drove up yesterday afternoon to see about things up there in Robertson County. And uh, by the time we stopped and bought gas and stopped and got something to eat and uh, ended up driving through Nashville traffic, it was about 8 o'clock when we got home, and do y'all know that traffic, what I used to consider to be Nashville rush hour traffic is 24 hours a day now? Uh, I mean, I'm going to guess that that's kind of the way it was back there in Jerusalem at that time, uh, really, even though by our standards, Jerusalem was just a little bitty town. Uh, but at certain times, it swelled to huge amounts. And, of course, when Nicodemus came to Jesus, it was during one of those festival times. So he's coming in. And, you know, curious to me, the way that Nicodemus talked to Jesus, he comes in bringing compliments. Do you see that? This is all the principles of how you ought to get along with people. I mean, he starts out by saying... Rabbi, he calls him rabbi, which was a special title for teachers during that time and still is. Uh, rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God. No one can do these signs you do unless God is with him. And, you know, if Jesus was ready to follow all of the guidelines of how to win friends and influence people, you'd think that he'd come back and compliment Nicodemus, but that's not what Jesus does. One of the things that I find quite interesting, for instance, when I read the Bible, particularly when I read Jesus, is that he often says things that my first response was, why would you do that? And he does that to Nicodemus. His response is, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Jesus didn't waste any time with polite responses. He just went to immediately one of the things that is going on here. And so he immediately says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now, I, what I really want to spend more time with in this message, and time is ticking away here, and we're going to have communion in just a few minutes, and so I don't want to spend a huge amount of time here, but when Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again, that becomes over these last couple of millennia a you know, kind of thing that we perk up and say, okay, there's this specific experience that you've got to have. And, you know, in our culture for at least the last 50 years or so, it's become buzzwords for what it means to be saved is to be born again. And right now, you know, what I've learned is that uh, in an awful lot of people's minds, it's kind of a code word for what political persuasion you'd be part of and uh, some of the other kinds of things that you might follow and do. And, and it's not that. It is, according to the Bible, an introduction to a new reality. And the reason you know that is when Nicodemus responds with, huh? Huh? That's my translation here of verse uh, 6. No, verse 4. I should put on my glasses. Um, you know, what it actually says is, Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now, I'll look further on down in this passage, but... 
See, one of the things that's going on here is that Jesus is talking about a different kind of reality than Nicodemus knows about. Now, one of the things it doesn't tell us in this passage is which religious group of his day Nicodemus belonged to. But what we're pretty confident is that all of the high priests that served in the temple in Jesus' day were Sadducees as opposed to most of the popular religious people of the Jewish day were Pharisees. Y'all have heard the difference between those two groups? The Pharisees' belief about uh, spiritual reality and life in the next world and that thing, an awful lot like what Jesus taught. The Sadducees, on the other hand, were different. The Sadducees didn't believe that there were miracles or angels. They didn't believe there was life after death. They didn't believe in a whole lot of the things that we as Christians take for granted as spiritual reality. Y'all heard how you can tell the difference between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I heard this when I first started studying for the ministry, and I'm always amazed that People still laugh at this, but I've heard people do it. They always laugh. See, the Sadducees were those people who didn't believe in life after death. That's why they were sad, you see. Uh, And I, I see the smiles on your face. You all have heard that one before, so you know how to, to think of it. Was Nicodemus a Sadducee? I don't know. But it could be that what he's responding to Jesus with it reveals the fact that he didn't really think there was any kind of spiritual reality. The only thing we can get a hold of is what is in our lives right here and now. Uh, Margie took me to the movie theater Friday night. I never go on my own. I was telling her after we got out of there, I don't think I even know how to go to the movies by myself because I don't know how to go up to the window and tell them what I want. Uh, You know, uh, there's more to that story than I'm telling right now, but but we went to see the Jesus Revolution Friday night. I know uh, Sandra said she saw it this week. Any of the rest of y'all been to the theater seen the Jesus Revolution yet? Uh, I recommend it. Uh, and if you hadn't heard of it, uh, it's in the movie theaters right now. I don't know how long it'll be there. Eventually it'll come out on video like everything else does. Maybe uh, we'll bring it in here and for you to watch uh, when we do that. Uh, but... I find it interesting because this has obviously been planned and made some time back that it is a recounting of the early days in California of the Jesus people revival movement. And, you know, interestingly, and of course I spent, like I always do on things, I spent a lot of time searching through the internet for more information about how it was made and, uh, You know, I overheard somebody that was talking about this say, yes, it's largely the story of how preacher Greg Laurie uh, came to Jesus in the middle of that. I kind of smiled and said, you know, I grew up during those days. I was somewhat aware of the Jesus people movement among the hippies of California. But the truth of the matter is, I really never met a hippie until I was in college. Uh, and then I just knew one. Uh, you know, his name was Ted, and he gave up being a hippie uh, early on. Margie's laughing because she knew him. And, you know, when I was working on my Ph.D. at the Southern Baptist Seminary, I was walking across campus from getting lunch one day, and I immediately, as I saw people walking around, I ran back to the library where Margie was moving, and I said, Honey, I think I just saw Ted! And... Uh, And Ted 
sure enough, we eventually tracked down where Ted was, and he had just enrolled in uh, Southern Baptist Seminary. I don't know all of the history that had, Ted had, but he had gone from being the most laid-back hippie guy in the college where I went to school at to being a Southern Baptist minister in just a few years. I mean, it was the most incredible transformation I ever ran into. He was highly motivated and ready to go, but not back in the days when I met him. Ted was just a, a hippie. I mean, when he and I sat down and talked about his life up to the point where he got to college, um, it was not like anything that I had ever been around in my life. He, uh, he would have, was one of those people that just tried to experience everything. Now, I'm trying to get back to relating this to this passage of Scripture, so let me just talk about it. One of the things that stuck out to me watching this movie, which was a reminder of the way things were back then in the late 60s and early 70s, and I know for many of y'all that's ancient history that you can't imagine that you actually know anybody that lived in those days. But these people that were part of this hippie drug sex movement when they talked about this gathering of people who were hearing about Jesus, one of the things they said over and over again in this movie, and this is authentic, was they kept saying, what if it's real? And the preachers would get up in front of them, the ones that these people were listening to, was saying, now we're going to tell you the truth. And they would say, the truth? Is it real? And so Nicodemus, like Jesus points out by the way here, could not, could not have been ignorant of the fact that there were people who believed in spiritual reality that was beyond our physical world, but he was denying it, which we have an awful lot of people do. One of the things I've begun to realize is that when we hear all these people over the last few years say, well, do you believe in science? What they're saying is, are you willing to deny the reality of spiritual things beyond this physical life. And Jesus is saying, if you don't know spiritual reality, the way into that kingdom, that world, that reality, is to be born again. To be born again. So here's the question. Have you come into that reality? Because there's something beyond this physical world. It's real. What if it's real? What if it's real? If it is, it'll change your life. But we're living where everything around us is trying to force us out of that reality into the just physical realities. What if it's real? What if there's a spiritual world and life beyond this life? What if it is? Then let me tell you, there's nothing else more important than that. And that's what Jesus was saying to Nicodemus. And yes, it took Nicodemus a while to get there. But eventually, after Jesus was crucified on the cross, Nicodemus gave up his being a secret follower, and he went and took care of Jesus. How much did he understand? We don't know. But it looks like to me he understood more than Jesus' 12 followers that had been with him all the time. He understood. Now, we're going to have communion service today. Christ our Lord invites to this table all those who are willing to repent of their sins and to seek to know forgiveness 
and peace with their neighbors. This is not just for those of us who are members of this church or of this denomination or, you know, even for those who yet know the new birth. It's for all those who are willing to receive what God has offered. And I can say to you that following the teaching of the founder of the Methodist movement, uh, this is possible that when you receive it, you are receiving uh, the grace that God has offered to each of us. And so this morning, if you don't know the grace of God in your life, and you want to, uh, you know, those early Methodists, the one requirement to be a part of it was a desire to flee the wrath to come. That was the language that they used. And so we're all invited today. I would encourage you to bow before the Lord and repent of your sins today. The readings for the communion service are going to be up here on the screen as well as uh, the responses at least to the crowd as well as in the hymnal on pages 15 and 16. Um, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and holy thing always and everywhere to give praise to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. O oh Lord, we thank you for coming into our world and suffering and dying on the cross for us. And because we are putting our faith in you, we're introduced into a new spiritual reality that is beyond just this physical world. Lord, we pray today that you would allow us to put our faith in you and to know what you have done for us. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, offered it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, as often as you eat it, do it in remembrance of me. Likewise, that same night, he took a cup, blessed it, gave it to his disciples, said, This is my blood of the new covenant, as often as you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ has come again. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on those of us who are gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, offered for us for the redemption of the world, so that we might be offered for the world, your people, in ministry to everyone. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask Hunter and Emily to come and help us. We've got this tray here uh, that is uh, to receive the used uh, elements. And so we would invite you to come. Uh, when you're ready and to receive and uh, then go back to your place, if some of you would like to kneel on these cushions up here and pray, you're invited to do that as well.
Pastor Bob asked me <clears throat> asked me to conclude the service because he's running late to get to Blanton. So if you would stand and join me in the last hymn, which is number 377, we'll sing the first verse only, It Is Well With My Soul. the God that created us all go with you this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs> 